You are a person who does well with change. That's something Daniel told me a few weeks ago when we were talking about what I was going to do with myself after I retired, a question that has been in my mind a bit over these past few weeks. I came to the decision to retire um, rather suddenly and not quite the way I thought I would. For a while now, I've been wondering if I should um, retire, and each year I have been asking friends and people I trust, people that have been spiritual guides to me through the years to help me discern this, and then I did the same this year. I went to Holy Wisdom Monastery, which is in Madison, Wisconsin, for a week, and I was there during the polar vortex. As you can well imagine, there weren't very many people there. And the ones that were there, we didn't go very far. We just walked across the path to the, to the uh, worship area and back to our rooms most of the time because of how cold it was. Well, I went through the list of people that I always call, and there was one person left on the list. I had already tried the approach of doing a to-do list, a to-don't list, uh, you know, all of those kinds of things, measuring and weighing what is what, and that hadn't worked, and there was one person left to call. So I called him, it was Morgan, and he told me a story. The story was about Christmas. Uh, Morgan is now 92 years old, and um, he had fallen twice in his home around Christmas time, and he had hit his head. And as he was telling me that story, he said to me, Karen, if you want us to write that book together, we better get started. I hung up the phone and the decision was made. So I didn't get to the decision of retiring by carefully considering. I didn't do any of the things that we do before we make big decisions, although I, I believe we don't always just think things through. In this case, I took a leap. And that leap is where I am still today. I was transported from where I was, which was comfortable serving this congregation and feeling wonderful about all of you and all of the growth we have seen, transported from that comfortable, wonderful place to somewhere else because of one conversation. Same thing happened to Peter. Peter was an observant Jew. He had never eaten anything unclean. And then one, one night while he was asleep, he had a vision. And God presented him with a sheet. And on that sheet were all kinds of unclean animals. And God said to Peter, Peter, go kill and eat. Peter was astonished and appalled by that. And he said, Oh, Lord, I have never eaten anything unclean. Well, listen with me to the rest of that story that comes to us in Acts chapter 11, starting with verse 1. Now, the apostles and the believers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him, saying, Why do you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? Then Peter began to explain to them step by step, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. There was something like a large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four corners, and it came close to me. As I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I replied, By no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. 
But a second time, the voice answered from heaven, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times. Then everything was pulled up again to heaven. At that very moment, three men sent to me from Caesarea arrived at the home where we were. The Spirit told me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and us. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen the angel standing in the house and saying, Send him to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as it had upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord. How he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? When they heard this, they were silenced and they praised God saying, then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. Even to the Gentiles. How many Gentiles do we have in the room today? Hmm. Hmm. Quite a few. Okay, if you're not a Jew, guess what you are? Okay. The Gentiles were the other people. They were the people who were not Jews. When I went to the Holocaust Museum in Skokie a few years ago, after I was done, I walked out, and there's a beautiful garden there. And I saw a sign on it, and it said, In memory of the righteous Gentiles who saved our people during the, during the Holocaust. That came to mind last year when Dan was telling me about how at the synagogue they were talking about righteous Gentiles who saved Jews from going into concentration camps. And I became disturbed by all of that. And I looked at Dan and I said, does that mean for me to be righteous, I have to save Jews from the Holocaust? We're still... looking at that question a little bit. Righteous Gentiles. Hmm. Well, the the people in our story believed in righteous Jews, as you probably noticed. The first Christians were Jews, every one of them. All of the disciples were Jews. And they worshipped at the synagogue in Jerusalem. They were welcomed there. The Jews who were followers of Jesus were able to worship together with all the other Jews in the synagogue in Jerusalem. But there were certain requirements. Those were, you had to be circumcised, you had to follow dietary laws, and you had to be baptized in the faith. Now, there was great consternation among the Jews in Jerusalem, the Jews who believed in Jesus, the Jews who were following him at that synagogue because they heard a terrible rumor. They heard that Peter was dining with an unrighteous Gentile, Cornelius. Cornelius had never been circumcised. He had never been baptized into the faith, and he certainly didn't follow dietary laws. And yet here, Peter, who was righteous because he did all of those things, he was righteous and he was clean, was sitting down and having a meal with an unclean person. They called him up and told him he had to come and present himself to the leaders of that church and explain himself. Now, these people that were the leaders of that Jerusalem church were not some kind of petty 
religious leaders. No, these were the very leaders of the nascent church that one day would become what we know as Christianity. And they believed that anyone who came into the faith had to follow all of the rules of the faith, which means everyone must be circumcised, baptized, and follow the dietary laws. Peter violated that. He had some explaining to do. But as you will remember, Peter was not one to hold his tongue. And he was quite impetuous, and he was ready to go. He went to that group of leaders, and he stood right before him, them, but he did not try to talk them out of believing what they believed. Have you ever tried to talk someone out of believing what they believe? That's all right. No one has to admit that. But I can tell you from my own experience, it never works. It never works. Peter did not do that. He told them a story. A story. He told them his story. The story about how the sheet had been spread out before him and he was told to kill and eat and he was not to call anything unclean that God had made clean. And after he told that story, all those leaders in that synagogue in Jerusalem were silent. But then... One of them began to speak up and say, the grace of God and the spirit of God has been poured out even on the Gentiles. The same grace, the same spirit that has been shared with us has been shared with them. They can join us in the repentance that leads to salvation and they worship God. They were so happy, so joyful. Can you imagine something like that happening today when we find out that some group of people were actually clean and and part of us? I don't know if, if we would have responded in the same way that this synagogue did, but they did. They responded with joy. And they responded not to an argument. They responded to a story. And that is how we began as Christians. We began right there in the synagogue. You know, we're living in a day now where separation is becoming the way of life for many of us in the world. We have become so divided that it is very difficult to imagine us as one family of God. But that does not have to be the way the world would look. And it was not the way the world looked to that synagogue in Jerusalem either. They found their way into unity through story through telling stories. About two or three weeks ago, I, would, I joined the youth Sunday school class when they were, they were preparing for Youth Sunday, and Sean told our class a, a story, something he had seen that had, it was about a group of people who were worshiping, and they were worshiping by telling stories. They weren't worshiping by being told what they should believe, They were taking the scripture stories and then they were telling stories about their lives that illustrated the scripture stories. That little conversation has really stayed with me because as you know, last week when we had you Sunday, we heard stories. We heard stories from the four people who came up and shared their reflections. Stories are what will one day bind us together into one. That is what we must start doing. We must stop arguing 
about who is in and who is out and who is righteous and who is not and start sitting down with one another and telling our stories. Because our stories are going to bear a great similarity. We all came from God. And we are all going back to God. We are all on a journey. And that journey can be shared. And when it is shared, we begin to bind ourselves together in the grace of God. Who are we to hinder God's grace that has been poured out even on the Gentiles? Who are we to stop the God who so loved the world that he gave his son so that whosoever believes will not perish in it, but have eternal life? God is on a mission for all of humanity. We too are asked to join in that very same story, a story that we see again today when we baptize Graceland, a story of blessing. Everything about baptism is blessing. It's all blessing. When Jesus was baptized, God came down, tore open the heavens and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. God blessed Jesus. And when we baptize We bless a child that is just getting started in this world. And we begin a life that is all blessing, all the way to the end. All the way to the end. We live in this blessing that God has bestowed on us in his grace. So let's start telling stories, shall we? Stories of our lives. Stories of how God has changed our mind. Or God has put us on a different path. Stories that will bless all of God's children. That will bring us together again as one family.